We're in the second sermon of the series, Holy Sexuality, and I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. In the first sermon, a couple of weeks ago, we considered the marriage bed, the truth that God created marriage for a man and a woman, gave sex to them as a gift uh, for the marriage. It's a wonderful gift when practiced within God's boundaries. It's a dangerous, it can become dangerous and sinful when practiced outside of those boundaries. And we looked at some of the ways that we sin against the marriage bed, the quick race to divorce court, the cohabitation, pornography, adultery. So if you assume that the only serious sexual sins in the world are same-sex sins, then you are mistaken because there is plenty, as we've learned, plenty of heterosexual sin to go around. And across the centuries, heterosexual sin has done more damage to families and to children than homosexual sins. So we heterosexuals need to humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways before we get too up in arms about homosexual sin. That said, this week we're considering homosexuality and if we've taken stock of our own bent towards sin, perhaps we'll approach this Uh, with less self-righteousness and more compassion. The Bible labels homosexual behavior as sin, but the Bible's not fixated on homosexual sin. The Bible's about larger things than that, and what the Bible says about homosexuality does not represent all of the things that God would want to say to homosexual people. Uh, God has a word for every one of us in our brokenness, whether that shows up in the same-sex attraction or in a lust for the opposite sex, in greed, arrogance, drunkenness, or whatever. And that message, that word he wants to say to all of us is the gospel. You are more sinful than you dared believe, and you are more loved than you dared imagine. Jesus is the way to forgiveness and life and the joy of becoming a new creation in him. But before we're made new in Christ, we're broken in many ways. Some are broken by same-sex attraction. A recent Gallup poll suggests that 7.1% of Americans identify as LGBT. The Bible does not condemn someone who feels same-sex attraction any more than it condemns a heterosexual for feeling opposite sex attraction. It's not what we feel so much as what we do with what we feel that moves us into sin. Do we let attraction turn to lust? When we do, whether hetero or homosexual, we sin. And beyond beyond lust, when heterosexuals engage in sex outside of marriage, they sin. When homosexuals engage in sex with one another, they sin. Now, I realize this is countercultural. This is unpopular to say such a thing. When I began my ministry more than 40 years ago, everybody knew this and assumed this to be the truth. That is not the case anymore. So when I make these statements, some would charge that by just saying that homosexual sex is a sin, that I am practicing hate speech. And yet no one would accuse me of hate speech by declaring that premarital sex or adultery is sin. I might be called out of touch, I might be called old-fashioned for saying those things, but I wouldn't be called a hater. This is where politics gets all mixed up in this matter. But followers of Jesus are not concerned about the politics of the matter. Kindness, yes. Understanding, yes. Love, yes. Politics, no. Our concern is this. What does the Bible say? And the Bible declares without equivocation that homosexual sex is sin, and it does so with the same clarity as it declares adultery a sin. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
Now, if this were the only place in the Bible that condemned homosexual behavior as sin, that would be enough, but it is not. Here's a quick survey of other texts in both Old Testament and New. In Genesis 19, uh, we read the story of Sodom in which, as Genesis 19.4 says, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population wanted to have sex with the male angelic visitors that had come to warn Lot and his family to get out of Sodom before uh, God brought judgment on the city. Um, those who want the Bible to say whatever they want it to say uh, suggests that Sodom's only sin was inhospitality. They ignore the basic sexual dimensions of Sodom's guilt, and that viewpoint is an insult to basic hermeneutics and to the history of biblical interpretation across the ages. Was homosexual sin the only problem in Sodom? No. Ezekiel 16:49 cites a list of some other sins involved there, but in verse 7 of the letter of Jude in the New Testament, Jude writes, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Second Peter 2, 6 and 7 points to Sodom's sexual sins as well. And then in the Old Testament, we read the prohibitions that are in the law in Leviticus 18:22 and chapter 20 verse 13 these laws that are set in the context of other sexual sins declare that a man lying with a man as with a woman is an abomination worthy of death now that's not as some would say that's not about gay rape uh, it condemns even general consensual homosexual activity and that's and that's all the Old Testament has to say about that matter. That's it. That's all. It's not a lot. Because the Bible's concerned about far more matters than homosexual behavior. It's not a lot, but it's enough. And it's clear. And the New Testament also speaks into this matter. In Romans 1, Paul writes about how one manifestation of God's judgment is God giving people over to a depraved mind, which means letting them chase down whatever their sinful hearts desire and then reap the consequences of those decisions. Paul lists several examples of this. He says people exchange the glory of God for the images of creatures in verse 23. In verse 25, he says, people exchange the truth of God for a lie, which leads to full-blown idolatry and to the worship of created things. And then in verse 28, he said, people reject the knowledge of God, exchanging natural relations for unnatural ones. And Paul's example here is homosexual behavior. In Romans 1, verses 26 and 27, Paul writes, for this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions, their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men in the same way also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. Now, Scripture Twisters suggests that Paul is writing here about heterosexuals who engage in homosexual behavior because that wouldn't be natural to them. Homosexual relations are natural to the homosexual, they suggest. So the Bible here is not condemning their behavior. Well, that interpretation reads into the Bible, not out of the Bible. And it's contrary to centuries of biblical interpretation in the church. Has the church been wrong on this issue for more than 2,000 years? And we're only enlightened in this day? No. No. The New Testament scholar Richard Hayes gets to the heart of it, heart of what Paul's doing in this text. Hayes writes, Paul portrays homosexual behavior as a sacrament, so to speak, of the anti-religion of human beings who refuse to honor God as creator. When human beings engage in homosexual activity, they enact an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual reality, the rejection of God the creator's design. Thus, Paul's choice of homosexuality as an illustration of human depravity is not merely random. It serves his, it, his rhetorical purposes by providing a vivid image of humanity's primal rejection 
of the sovereignty of God the Creator. Jackie Lee Perry struggled with lesbian impulses, I lived that lifestyle for a while and came to this realization. She said, I love my girlfriend too much not to be appalled at the prospect of laying aside not only the way I loved, but also who I loved. I loved her and she loved me, but God loved me more. So much more that he wouldn't have me going about the rest of my life convinced that a creature's love was better than the king's. Homosexual behavior, the Bible teaches, is unnatural compared to the way God created men and women. Paul identifies homosexual behavior as idolatrous sin. And this isn't the only place Paul deals with the matter. He also addresses it in 1 Timothy 1, 9, and 10, and he addresses it in the 1 Corinthians text we read just a few minutes ago. Paul lists numerous sins in our text, didn't he? There's sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, thievery, greed, drunkenness, verbal abuse, swindling, and the practice of homosexuality. In the Greek text, Paul uses both New Testament words for homosexuality. Now, some translations render both words separately, but the CSB gathers up both words in one phrase, males who have sex with males. Uh, the first Greek word means soft or effeminate. The second word is a compound word meaning male and coitus. These are the same two Greek words that are used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament of those Leviticus texts we talked about a moment ago. So whether a person is the aggressor in that kind of relationship or a passive partner, whether one plays the role of a female and the other the role of a male, the activity is sin. Obviously, the victim of homosexual rape has not sinned, but Paul's not talking about rape here. He's talking about general homosexual behavior. Now, could these texts be any clearer? And they are clear on their face. An interpreter doesn't have to do aggressive word studies. Doesn't have to do some deep textual analysis to dig out the meaning. The meaning's clear. Well, not so fast, some say. That's just Paul in the Old Testament. Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. So I guess to Jesus, it's no big deal. Well, it is true that Jesus didn't say one word about homosexuality directly. But he did include sexual immorality in a list of evils in Mark 7, 20 through 23. Included, included sexual immorality along with theft and murder and envy and slander and arrogance and folly. Jesus said these kinds of evils come from inside of a person and they defile that person. Sexual immorality, the Greek pornoi, is the catch-all word in the New Testament, the catch-all Greek word for sexual sin. So it's reasonable to assume that Jesus includes homosexual sin under that big umbrella and that his hearers would have assumed that was the case. And it's also important to realize that Jesus did his ministry in a Jewish context. Jews understood. Jews had a natural understanding. They'd been schooled on it their whole lives that homosexual behavior is sin. And so far as we know, it was not even widely practiced and widely practiced in Jewish cultures. Paul, on the other hand, he did his work in pagan Gentile contexts where homosexual activity was common and generally accepted. Paul believed Gentile Christians needed to know the truth and they needed to say it as clearly as he could. Now, in the space of a sermon, we can't deal a great deal in depth with everything the Bible has to say about homosexual behavior. But we can certainly see in just this brief survey of relevant texts that the Bible is clear on this matter. It is clear. Like other sins Paul lists in our text, sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, thievery, greed, drunkenness, and the rest, homosexual behavior is a sin against God, it's a sin against the self, and it's a sin against others. Richard Hayes adds, the New Testament offers no accounts of homosexual Christians, tells no stories of same-sex lovers, ventures no metaphors that place a positive construal on homosexual relations. Our first Corinthians text affirms this, and as we read in verses 9 and 10, those who do not repent of such sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. This sin, like all sin, is serious business. Heaven and hell is at stake. So, what are those of us who don't struggle 
with same-sex attraction, what are we to make of these texts? Well, such texts remind us that, that homosexual sin is one sin among many. While you may not deal with the temptation to practice homosexual behavior, you face other temptations. You struggle with other sins. So instead of being self-righteous, be understanding. What sin or sins have you by the throat? You know what a struggle it is to overcome them, don't you? And you know the power of sexual drives. You understand that. Those with the same sex and temptations, they struggle every bit as much. So don't be smug and condescending here and don't assume that changing same-sex attraction is like flipping a switch. And don't behave hatefully. Apart from Christ, your sins are going to keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God too. Jesus' posture means that we're going to be understanding, patient, and, and gracious with people. Now, I know when homosexual behaviors, we feel like it's forced on us by media and entertainment and education. It's not easy to be either gracious or understanding. But as we deal with individuals, let's work extra hard at being gracious instead of hateful and kind instead of mean. And, and let's do this. Let's befriend those in your circle who struggle with same-sex attraction. If a friend or a relative confides in you of this struggle or of a fall in this area, don't abandon him. Stick with this friend. Pray for him. Encourage him. Encourage her. Point her to Jesus. Invite him to church. And here's another thing. Don't try to fix your friends who struggle with homosexual temptations and sin. Just, just point them to Jesus. If Jesus delivers them, praise the Lord. If he doesn't deliver them on your timetable, don't abandon them. There, there are Christians with same-sex attraction who are going to battle this temptation and these urges until Jesus takes them home to heaven. So let Jesus work on that part of the equation. Your part is to keep pointing them to the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. To encourage them not to surrender to their temptations, but to walk faithfully with Jesus. So there is a word in these texts for those of us who don't struggle with same-sex attraction, and there's a word for those who do struggle with same-sex attraction and with homosexual sin. The first word is a corrective word, repent. Don't indulge the attraction. I say this in love. I say it in the same spirit. I'd say it to an adulterer or to someone who's practicing premarital sex or someone who's a slave to greed or drunkenness or any other sin. I say it in the same spirit in which I'd flag down passing motors to tell them that there's a bridge out up the road. Danger ahead. As the Bible says, if you have an unrepentant heart in this matter, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God any more than any other unrepentant sinner. So the first word is corrective. Repent. Turn from your sin and find forgiveness in Jesus. Wesley Hill grew up in a Christian home. His parents taught him biblical views on sexuality. Hill writes, confusingly, I found myself just when all my friends were beginning to notice girls and become interested in dating, having longings to be in that kind of relationship with a member of my own sex. And after receiving wise and loving guidance from Christian mentors, Hill writes, as I discovered more about Christianity's historic teaching, I found myself convinced of the position which the church has held with almost total unanimity across the ages that although many people find themselves through no fault of their own to have sexual desires for members of their own sex, this is not something to be affirmed and celebrated, but it is rather a sign that we are broken in need of redemption and recreation. Gay people are not uniquely broken. That's a position that we share with every other human being who's ever lived or will live, but we are nonetheless broken. And following Jesus means turning our backs on a life of sexual sin just as it does for every other Christian. The Bible as a whole, and our text in particular, offers a corrective word to those who struggle with same-sex attraction and homosexual sin. But there's also a hopeful word. First, you're not defined by your sexual preference. I feel like I need to say that again because the whole world tells you that you are. 
You are not defined by your sexual preference. Your life is way larger than that. Will Williman reminds us that in a culture like ours that's preoccupied with sex and values sex pleasure as life's highest good, we simply cannot imagine any fully human being who's not driven by genitalia. You don't have to be. Your sexual identity is not the most important thing about you. You have been created in the image of God. Your sexual attractions may be broken, but God's image is still imprinted in your life. And if you have a saving relationship with Jesus, then your life is defined by Jesus Christ. You are a follower of Jesus, and that is the most important thing about you. That means you don't have to indulge your homosexual temptations to be who God made you to be, a follower of Jesus who denies himself and takes up his cross daily and follows Jesus even when it's hard to do so, especially when it's hard to do so. So don't give in to the lesser things and the broken things about your life. Live in light of the larger, more important things. In verse 11 of our text, after listing these various sins, Paul writes, and some of you used to be like this. That's past tense. Used to be. They were forgiven. Their identity transformed from thieves and idolaters and adulterers and practicing homosexuals to you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Your life's not defined by your sexual preferences or the brokenness that you have, whether it's hetero or homosexual. Your life is defined by your creation in the image of God and by who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done and can do in your life. By the Spirit of our God. Not in your power, but in His. And here's another hopeful word. There is strength and mercy in the Lord. You're not alone in your struggle. God is with you. God can help you. And when and if you stumble, God can forgive your sin, set things right, and get you started again down the path of following Jesus in this area of your life. Whether God fully delivers you from this temptation or not, God is with you and God will help you. 1 Corinthians 13.10 promises no temptation has come upon you except what's common to humanity, but God's faithful. He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also provide a way out so that you may be able to bear it. There is mercy and strength and escape with the Lord. And here's still another hopeful word, God can use your life. I could tell you about Sam Alberry, who's a pastor in the UK, Although Alberry struggles with same-sex attraction, he doesn't act on it. He lives a single, celibate, holy life, and God uses him both in his church ministry and as an author. And if you struggle with same-sex attraction, and if you've even practiced those things, when you come to Christ for washing and justifying and sanctifying, you are not disqualified, and God can use your life. I could tell you about Rosaria Champagne Butterfield a self-described leftist lesbian professor at Syracuse University who, over time, through the loving hospitality of a local pastor and his wife, came to Christ and found deliverance, full deliverance, in what she calls her train wreck conversion. She's now a pastor's wife and an author. And I could tell you a little more about Wesley Hill. He tells a story that helped him recognize that God could bless his life despite struggles and temptations with sex, same-sex attraction. He visited a friend and mentor named Chris, and after Wesley shared his struggles and asked for advice, this is what Chris said to Wesley. He said, imagine yourself standing in the presence of God, looking down from heaven on the earthly life you're about to be born into, and God says to you, Wes, I'm going to send you into the world for 60 or 70 or 80 years. It's going to be hard. In fact, it's going to be more painful and confusing and distressing than you can now imagine. You will have a thorn in your flesh, a homosexual orientation that's the result of you entering a world that sin and death have broken. And you may wrestle with it all your life, but I will be with you and I will be watching every step you take, guiding you by my spirit, supplying you with grace, sufficient for each day and at the end of your journey you're going to see my face again and the joy we share then will be born out of the agonies you faithfully endured by the power I gave you and no one will take away that joy 
that solid resurrection joy, which if you experienced it now, would crush you with its weight. Wesley, Chris asks, wouldn't you say yes to the journey if you'd had that conversation with God? He'll said yes to the journey, walks it now, and God uses his life as a professor and an author who helps a lot of people. So God has some words in our text for those who struggle with same-sex attraction and homosexual sin. So, listen and act on God's word. To listen to the voices of our sex-saturated, sex-entitled culture in this matter is to act on the falsehoods, the lies that they preach and to take a life that's already broken in a hundred pieces and break it into a thousand more. Aren't those of you who struggle with this issue, aren't you ready to see some of the pieces of your life put back together? Come to Jesus. The sin forgiver. The burden bearer. The life changer. The strength provider and the lover of your soul. Come to Jesus. He'll meet you where you are. He will meet you in your brokenness and take you on a journey to a better place than your sin ever will. He will take you to a joy beyond your wildest imagination and to an eternity where brokenness is left at the door and all things become new. Come to Jesus and the rest of us let's try to be Jesus to some of them Father thank you for your word thank you that you speak into our lives that none of our sin takes you by surprise none of our temptations catch you off guard Thank you that you've designed us, you've created us. And by turning from our sins and giving you our lives, you will walk this journey with us, no matter how easy or how difficult it is. You will walk it with us and give us strength. As Paul said, by the Spirit of our God. So, you know our hearts. You know every one of us. You are the Father from whom no secret can be hidden. You know us. And so we pray today by your Holy Spirit and your personal love, you would speak into each individual heart. Whatever, whatever we need today, speak it to us. Give it to us. And give us, God, please, ears to hear. Minds to understand. Hearts to embrace. Feet to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you this morning to respond to the gospel. If you're here today or online and you don't know Jesus, today is the day. Come to Jesus. You've done nothing. I don't care what you've done. God's grace is so much deeper than your sin. Come to him today. Let him recreate you, make you a new creation in Christ. Say, Jesus, I want to turn from my sins and I want you to have my life. I want to give my life to you. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. Forgive me and cleanse me and give me a new beginning and he will do that. I invite you, Christian, to think about where you stand in this matter. Um, think about your own life, Christian. The way you talk about homosexual people, the way you deal with that issue would the people who don't already know you're a Christian ever have, a, ever have an idea that maybe you are one by the way you talk about others? If, so, if they wouldn't have an idea, they'd be surprised if they found out maybe it's time you take a Jesus posture towards sinners. Most of us are pretty good about taking a Jesus posture toward ourselves. We might as well take one towards others. That's what he calls us to do. So I invite you to respond however God leads you in that way, Christian. And you can come join the church if God puts that on your heart. If you want to come and pray, you can do that. We'll have ministers at the altar. You can text ACTION to 94000. You can deal with somebody on an online platform, get in a private chat room and talk with them. But you respond as we, as we uh, sing together and as we seek the face of the Lord. And if you know people who struggle with this issue, or if you struggle with it, 
Would you take these moments when we're singing and pray for that person or pray for yourself? Let's stand together as we sing.